I am going to talk about bid rig ports and um, basically ports, packages, and the like on, we'll say nicely, uncommon operating systems. Sorry, I just started. Ooh, and that's how you move forward. Great. Okay. Well, I'll let everyone, I'll let them come in. Then I'll. Okay, so, they say that, so BSD systems, we all know they're, you know, complete, they're supposed to be coherent, they've got whatever various thing about them is usually interesting. But is that actually enough? Like, you know, is that complete coherent system what you really use? And yes, I realize I'm not using one on this laptop now, but normally my day to day computing is off. So ultimately, if you've got a production system, a server that's doing something, you need more than what's in the base system. That's always the case. I, maybe some people have managed to get it perfect, but usually you need something. You need those four different versions of PHP or Ruby to get whatever insane scripts um, you use. I personally am working on something that I need two different versions of Node just to make things work. And then, if you're on a desktop or a laptop, you can forget about it, because now you need your web browser, if you need maybe your um, text editor, if you use one other than what base comes with, you need office systems, you need all sorts of stuff. So really, you need other things besides what your BSDs have, and that's kind of why Unix got to where it is. Third-party stuff, it was useful, that's why GNU, for better or worse, went with a Unix system for their stuff because things run on Unix. And so, to get, how do you get to all of this third-party stuff? You can do the whole configure, make, download, configure, make, make, install, do that dance, and you now have your package, and you're happy. And if it's just that one package, then life is good and your stuff works. But now that package depends on something else, and so you have to go a step back and install that, and if it's Firefox or something that takes a while, by the time you've compiled it, there's a security update for it. And you find yourself starting over. Chromium 2, you'd also have the same issue. You know, unless you want to use Lynx as your web browser, you have a lot of stuff and a ton of dependencies. So, and then these things depend on each other, and so on. So you end up with some sort of ports or packaging system, in you know BSD speak, it's usually ports, and, or in open BSD speak, which is what Bitring inherited, it's ports. So that's usually what I'll call it. But you know, I mean ports, packages, or whatever. And this is provided by your OS vendor. Usually, they provide something, and every system has their own one. That's usually a little different here or there, but more or less the same thing. So first, I just want to give a very brief mention of Bitring, which is a system that. You know, I've actually done some of this stuff on. And so Bitrig, according to our website, is a free, fast, secure, Unix-like system, and it's available on current platforms. That doesn't, and um, that's our website. And for the record, I'll make the uh, little plea that we are always looking for developers. So if you're interested in a BSD that is, um, we try to make it very easy for people to contribute in whatever way, you know, feel free to check us out. But Bitrig was based on OpenBSD it forked in 2012 for reasons that I do not want to discuss. But I wasn't there for any of them, so politically I have nothing to do with it. We had a 1.0 release in 2014, which was apparently almost two years ago. News to me, but whatever. But we've been using it um, in production systems. Some of us have been using it in most of our personal systems for a while before then. So, it is actually a usable system, and despite the infrequent releases, we do snapshots, which are, you know, they're not blessed as releases, but they are actually the sort of usable units of computing, I guess, or whatever you want to do. Now, why, what do we do that's different, or that makes it somewhat interesting, and then ends up giving me problems when I have to do ports for it, but what's different compared to OpenBSD? So, one big thing is we use Git, and GitHub for version control. And you know, I have nothing against CVS. It's 
you know, I used it for a long time. I have nothing against the version. I used it not for as long, but I did use it. But uh, we find that there's a lot of sometimes younger, sometimes not even younger developers who have absolutely just religious convictions against CVS. And using Git and GitHub, which is where a lot of projects actually do things, that's the way a lot of people want to develop. So by doing that, we hope to make it easier for them. And honestly, there are some very good features of Git. There are, you know, it's, speed's not one of them, but in a lot of ways, it's a nice system. So we're trying to do these sort of modern development practices where people do pull requests on GitHub and things like that, which, again, there's nothing wrong with mailing lists, but a tremendous amount of projects do it the other way. So if you have nearly a generation of people who have primarily worked in that manner, and that could be helpful for them. On the less sort of fuzzy side, we moved to claim for our default compiler. Uh, we focus only on AMD 64 and R. Most of us like older computers and have various, you know, Zoruses and other, I don't want to say junk, but I don't use, you know, but around. But by moving to just those two things, three if you count the, you know, 64-bit ARM, which is still working on, it frees up resources, it gets rid of code, and it means we never have to say, is this a default that's appropriate for some old system or not? We can say, is this appropriate for the systems that we actually use for what we actually do? And that even means no 386 because I have no working hardware left like that, and neither do some of the other developers. So we don't we decided we have to not care. And there's other people who support those, so oh. we have other changes in there too, it's like TempFS stuff and things, but none of those are actually relevant for what it's uh, talked about here. Now our port system is open, it's based on OpenBSD ports. We basically imported that. It's make files, Perl to do the tools, and patches for the things that unfortunately don't either compile or do what they're supposed to as is. So if you've used OpenBSD, then the port system is gonna feel the same. Only we don't make the distinction that we don't want users to use ports, we only want them to use packages. I personally don't care, and for the most part, I think the rest of the Bitrix developers, if you're using one, we're, either one, we're happy. But, so, that's sort of a minor thing. Now, I said, it should be a whole lot like OpenBSD ports. And it is, but in reality, that never quite totally works out, so. We end up with this situation where does your software work on us? Do the ports do what? Will that third party thing work? And basically what you find is, as I'm sure people here have um, you know, felt this pain, everybody supports Linux. Sometimes you support OS X and sometimes you support FreeBSD. And that's usually close to the extent of what people think about. And POSIX is sort of supposed to fix that. You know, we've got a standard that you can follow, and programs that follow that should work, but that's just a set of system calls and some other things. It doesn't really get you, you know, it doesn't get you Firefox compiling. So what happens when you're in a less common system? I thought people went through this in the 80s and the up through the early 90s even, where there were a ton of different Unixes and everyone was different and nothing worked anywhere. And that ended, you know. The odds are you probably, I haven't had to support Solaris and anything I've done for work since 2008. You know, Irix, Unicos, a whole list of things are, you know, for better or worse, mostly gone. But you still have a bunch of BSDs which are close. And then if you're on something weird, so, you know, Plan 9, or some anything other than the mainstream, you start having problems with third-party things. Now, just to give you a sense of the scale of this, I did a, this was sort of quick numbers for things. And Bitrig, you know, we have less packages than everyone else, which is fine, because maybe, you know, OpenBSD more, and it keeps going. These numbers aren't exact because people 
break things up differently. Like some of the Linux ones have this tendency to have a development headers in separate packages. And do you have, you know, how many versions of Ruby do you feel like you want to have? How many uh, ways do you break up LaTeX? But either way, what we see is, I guess we should all just use Debian because they have more packages than everyone, right? But um, since obviously most of us wouldn't be here if we decided that, that's not the only solution. Maybe we don't actually need every package. Maybe we just need to make sure our things work. Now, so we, since we've committed to not just using Debian and trying to do things, we now try to make these packages work on our things. And you hope auto tools and all of the um, wonderful things that come in there will help you. You know, if they do say, you know, when you go to the either configure or one of them says you test for you test for um, capabilities, you don't test for names. And I don't know that I've ever seen a make file that doesn't have if um, either OS or whatever variable they're looking at equals equals something. Do this or that. Sometimes it's even worse than they ask for versions of them. So clearly, we do have um, actual portability things that have been baked into individual packages. And you, and they're not always even really things that are ultimately you know, portability problems. They're just assumptions that people have built into the packages. And a lot of the ones that we hit all the time are OS name, which is seems dumb, but it's a problem. You know, even, even if we were functionally completely equivalent to OpenBSD just renaming the system and all of a sudden you have huge swaps of programs that will not compile for you anymore and that just don't work without patching. You have the compiler and the compiler version. Sometimes you just have hacks. Things put things, you know, different systems put some things in different places. Like um, these maps for reasons that I can't understand use slash users instead of slash home. And that shouldn't ever that shouldn't ever be a problem for a reasonable for reasonable software, but it is. There are, you know, different conventions like how do you start daemons and, you know, do you use the various, um, you know, commands, do you use, whatever. There's, you know, every system does some little things differently. And then there are, do you just lack some feature? Do you either have or not have some feature that you need? Do you have a case sensitive file system? Do you have, um, I guess, do you know which um, cryptographic things do you have? Just what is actually there for programs to use? So just on the name thing, one thing that we hit in Bitrig a couple times is there are things that actually check is your file, you know, if OS name equals, equals star BSD. And they try to lump all the BSDs together that way. So if you decide you have to fork a BSD for whatever reason, don't do what we do. Do not name it something that doesn't end BSD. The fact that I've had to patch make files for that is upsetting. And so I wish I had been there when we decided on the Bitrig name, but that is um, the fault of people, well, just one or two people. We should have asked the Dragonfly guys. We really should have. I just, I, yeah. We didn't. Yeah, we didn't. Because <laughs> you know, sometimes mistakes just have to be repeated over and over again. <laughs> right, exactly. The next time it decides, you know, like, I need to fork something. I'll know the name is better. So, compilers, we actually, you know, since we're using Clang and LLVM and all that instead of GCC, discover there is a lot of GCC only code out there. Not just in, um, you know, with, you know, so for our base system it compiles fine with Clang, but then with your third party stuff, there's, there are things that are, you know, GCC only. And even worse, there are things that are actually in a specific version of GCC only, which is why OpenBSD has multiple compilers in their um, ports. And that's, you know, a problem. Some of it's really GCC specific, as in, you know, there's GNU extensions and all that, but I'm not too surprised when Emacs doesn't want to compile with something else. But other times it's just non-standard or honestly broken C. Clang is good these days. This is not a while, not, you know, some number of years ago. And so sometimes you either have to pick, you know, say, I'm just going to use the compiler the code wants, and when you start doing that, you end up with more and more compilers, or you have to fix the code, which is sometimes not what you want. 
And I just have to say that for some reason, you know, Fortran people, we all knew that, that you were going to face more than one compiler in your life before. You know, when you compile on the IBM thing, you had their compiler. Sun had their compiler, and they were both, you needed both of them. For some reason, C and C++ people got into the idea that you have GCC, and you have the version of GCC that you are using right now, and that is the extent of the world. And I kind of wish that people had learned what the Fortran people learned a long time ago, because there's more compilers out there, even if it is just Clang and GCC. So there are some things that are easy. Interpreted languages are usually good. Generally, every Perl package works out fine regardless, it just, you know, does what it's supposed to and that's it. LaTeX fonts are not hard. Sometimes the um, interpreter is a problem, like, you know, you have multiple PHPs, you have Rubies, Node.js. Python doesn't have a lot, but it's still, you know, you need patches to make it work if you're on a weird system. And some of these guys are very, very friendly to weird systems and they'll take your patches, others less so. We will not name names, although we could. Now, what a lot of what tends to come up is people have asked, why don't we use one someone else's system? You know, NetBSD's package source is there's that there's package ng, although I'm not sure if that's the I forget if that's the command or the name of it. I'm not too familiar with that one, but or there's Gen Rebuilds, there's Nix, there's a whole bunch of systems out there that support multiple operating systems. Package source does work for Bitrate. You know, it does support it where one of their, I think they support everything, as far as I can tell. And so, why did we have to go with our own thing instead of doing one of those? If you do, if I use someone else, you know, if we were to say the hell of course, we're going to use something that, you know, mixed, we'd have a lot more committers in it right away. We'd have, um, and you need committers. Like, if you actually look, despite being superficially simple, there's usually more committers in, involved in ports than there are in the base systems. Even though the base systems are harder problems, you know, getting your kernel to do what it's going to do should be a harder problem than getting your text editor to compile. But when you realize that you now have that text editor plus a hundred other packages that you need to do whatever you're trying to do, you're not going to work on every one of them. And so you do need more people. And even better, if you do these shared systems, you don't have to merge. So I, you know, me and a couple other different people have to go and merge changes in from OpenBSD periodically. And merging anything is messy. So if we used a shared system, that would be awesome. That part is done. But we still have the main problem. If Firefox, and, and I mean, Firefox does work on Bitrate. They're just, you know, we have to fight it every time there's an update. But if Firefox doesn't compile on Bitrate, it doesn't matter if I'm trying to compile it with, um, you know, with NetBSD's package source or with our own ports. Guess what? It's still not going to compile. There's no magic in having a shared system. And even worse, at least with our ports, we can decide that something doesn't go to master until it works for us. Whereas, um, you know, NetBSD is not going to be a, and no one would want them to. It would be insane for them to hold things back and stay on an older version of something because one of the system one of their minority systems can't work. Doesn't work yet. Now that's just not the way it's gonna work and not something we would be able to ask them to do. So while those systems are great and I'd actually like to if I had more time spend some time with it, it's not it doesn't just solve all the problems. We're still back to the problems of making stuff work on your own system. Now, your other options, you could totally roll your own thing. Just go crazy. You've decided everyone else has done it wrong, and you have a better idea for packaging. OK, do it. <laughs> Good luck. And you know, don't tell me about it, because I don't want to know. Or you can do like these patch sets on other systems. I think Dragonfly recently moved to something like that, although I'm not super familiar. Kind of. Yeah, I thought there was. I thought they did, but there was some. There was some caveat to it. So I don't know. I think it sounds like an interesting idea, and I'm hoping when they've been doing it for a little while, I'll start looking into it more and see if it makes any more sense to me. But 
you know, or you can do what we do where you use an existing system and you can either decide, you know, we're using this existing system at one frozen point in time and moving forward, in which case you're down to, do you have enough developers to do that? We don't. Or you can use the, an existing system and say we're gonna, you know, develop on our own and then pull changes in. Which is what we do and it means that you have a lot of merging and, you know, things like that, which requires work, it requires people, but it's still, you know, get, you get changes and you have some ability to keep things up. So, we're doing that. We've gone with um, an existing system, we're working, and now we hit something that doesn't work. You know, we found some package, doesn't work. Probably there's about half a dozen to a dozen packages that depend on it that now don't work because of it, but, I mean, the worst case is something that compiles but doesn't work. Those are harder to catch and always harder to fix. Not really, in a sense, I'm considering those somewhat out of scope because when you have a ton of ports, I'm not sure how you would catch those all the time. And it's mostly the things that you, you that get used that you find that out and you fix. So in the case where it doesn't compile, you now have to go and fix it. And that's fine, you, you know, either patch make files or Hopefully you're patching code and not just patching make files, but sometimes you have to do that. And ports is a good system for that in that it, you know, applies to patches, does everything in fairly uh, clean ways, but, you know, you can do that. You could just drop the package. You know, you hit something, it doesn't compile. You're, sometimes the right choice is to say, that's it, I'm not interested in you anymore. Or, you know, if you maintain I guess I actually didn't read my slide, but um, your options once you found the fix is you can maintain that fix or, you know, you can try to upstream the fix. Usually that's the, either two or three are the best choices, but sometimes you're stuck with one. So, upstream. This is what you should do. If you go and fix something to make it work on the OS that you're using, especially if it's a weird one, but even if it's not, you probably should not carry these patches around you should try to upstream it. And, you know, they can either accept it, reject it, or completely ignore you. So, acceptance is obviously the best case. You know, it means that you don't have to keep anything local. The next time that you update the package, it will work. People have a tendency not to break code that's already in their tree, but they're very good at breaking code that's in your tree. So. If you can get this to happen, you really should do it. And at least in my experience, most upstream people are fine with that. Will, you know, upstream authors like you sending packages. And from what I've heard, people for some reason don't, you know, sometimes you figure, oh, they're not gonna take it, I shouldn't, you know, Ruby is a big project, why do they care if I have a patch for a subsystem that they've never heard of? Usually upstream authors are actually pretty happy with it. Being more portable almost never makes software worse. It usually, and I realize those are kind of the same thing, but it you know almost always makes it better. And also most people want users of their software. You don't go and put it on GitHub usually because you don't want anyone to touch it because you don't want it to be seen. You want users. So, People usually will take your patches and, or at least work with you to get them in. But just to you know, to show that I'm honest, there are times where, port where adding portability stuff does make things worse. I have seen, I have authored things where it makes it worse. You know, I'm thinking of their scientific code. This was one that this Fortran code that I worked on and used for years. The portability means just if death this, if if death Linux, if death death Sun OS. Blah, blah, blah. But usually that's special. A, if you're, usually if you're doing that, you're not doing portable software right. If you have to if dev everything, probably something's gone wrong, or it's a case where it's this, you know, the scientific software that needs to get every ounce out of the CPU because it's running for months on tons of machines, and it's, you know, you're gonna compile it special for each time anyway. But those are the only times that's gonna happen. Realistically, 
if you're doing that many if deaths in no, normal user level software, remember, not talking about, you know, in real life kernels and stuff, people, there's possibly, there might be all sorts of sins that go on in kernels that I don't want to know about. But for normal software, for normal people, we'll say, it's usually good. So, what, about, what happens when they reject your patch? So, you finally get it to work on uh, Bitrig or whatever it is you're using. And they say no. This is why people don't try to upstream stuff. I've absolutely told people, you know, with patches, please go try to send that to the upstream authors, and they don't because it's going to get rejected. It probably won't. There will be some, you know, languages named after um, a certain British comedy troupe that doesn't, don't necessarily want to take patches from smaller things, but for the most part, they will, or it'll, you know, they may not like it because you didn't follow their standard or whatever, and you can fix that. And really, really, in those cases where there's something you can resolve, you'd be better off doing, you would have been better off doing it that way in the first place. Maybe you didn't know about it yet, but you should do it, and it's good. Now, the one that's not so good is where you just don't hear back from the author, authors at all. Like, if a project is hosted on SourceForge, there's a real good chance there is no one on the other end of that contact email who's ever going to see your patch. And some authors just don't respond to things or, you know, I'm not saying I've never left an email in my inbox for a year. So these things happen, but, you know, in those cases, you actually do have a hard decision to make. Do you just drop the program? You know, it's like we were saying, as we said with the slide about Debian, the number of patches you have doesn't necessarily, or the number of program, third-party things you have doesn't really, is not directly proportional to the quality of your operating system. And that's hard for me to say because, you know, if I'm the type of person who would put up a slide with the number of packages different systems like, clearly it means that I like packet, I like there to be a lot of packages. But sometimes you don't. That's not the best. You could maintain the patches yourself, or you could just fork these, the program and effectively maintain the whole thing. Now, dropping it, I think I sort of said some of this, but you know, if you can't get your patches upstream, you should think about, do you need this program? Is there any reason to package this at all? Do you want something that's never, ever going to have a security update again? Sometimes you need it. You will hit programs that have, you know, all of these problems, but it fits this, you know, you've got this one business critical thing that requires it, and you're never going to update all that PHP to work on a version of PHP from this decade or whatever. So it happens, but you should think very long and hard about not doing it. And like I said, packagers like to have packages, so. Now, you could just fork it when you, if the package was, if the program, if the third party thing that you had, that you had to fix for you worked on GitHub, was on GitHub, when you tried to upstream it, you probably made a fork of the repo and then submitted that. So you already have a fork, this is the way their workflow goes, and you could do that, and sometimes you should, it means you won't get updates automatically from upstream, if there even is, but that might not be bad in that you now have to intentionally update rather than just going and seeing it, but the problem is you may end up, you know, supporting this fork for the rest of your natural life, which maybe you're okay with, maybe you're not. Depends on how much you care about that particular software. Usually what you do is you just keep the patches in your tree somehow, which, you know, it means you're only carrying around a couple, you know, patches, which are small. It means, you know, patches are very brittle. So the next time they make any sort of change, your, you know, your wonderful patch that made sure it now recognized OS name equals bitrig will fail. And also, someone, no one else ever actually gets to use your benefits. So this is the worst solution, and it's the one you're you end up doing most of the time. So, there are actually, um, no, I'll get to that after. So, for developers, the people writing these apps that we're now trying very hard to squeeze into our, onto our VSD system, what can you do? You can write your code to be portable. <laughs> you know, that, that's not, not to 
you know, minimize the work of writing portable software, but, you know, the world is not just Linux and OS X, and again, I'm sorry I'm doing this on an OS X laptop, but this is so much lighter than my ThinkPad. I really didn't want the ThinkPad on the plane. You know, you can choose sensible defaults. Like, that's a big one. Rather than just when your config script says, um, you know, hits an OS it doesn't like, rather than failing on OS unknown, just, you know, throw whatever the defaults in there that seem to make sense. Please don't hard code compiler names in your make files. You may call it GCC, I may have to call it EGCC. Call it CC maybe, and you know, we can all be happy. If you can, try and get more than one compiler. Very, you probably can't, but it would be nice and very likely it might catch some bug that you actually have. If you could, you could test on other systems. Yeah, automated builds, things like Travis are great for that. Be nice to those of us who try to send you patches. We really, but for the most part, everyone is. So that one of just isn't too seriously. And so these are my conclusions, but I did want, but the one other thing that I didn't have a slide for was, so recently we've been sort of toying with in Bitrig, just fake, fake more or less in the uh, port system when you build faking an OS name, so rather than relying on everyone recognizing Bitrig, more or less faking that and try to get that it's open BSD because we're almost open BSD for a lot of the practical ways for that outside of compilers. But I, we haven't actually done that. I think that's just some sort of pilot work that Marco has been uh, poking around at. So there's not a ton to say for that one yet. But so my conclusions are just third party packages matter. It doesn't matter how complete your OS is, you need these other things. If you fix something, get it upstream. Do anything you can not to keep it local. And if you're writing stuff that's not an operating system, try to be portable. Try to remember that there's more than Linux and OS X. And that is pretty much, well, okay, that program does not end when you <laughs> go after the end of it. I told you I don't use a Mac. But um, yeah, that is it. So are there any questions? Um, first of all, there's a huge difference between portable software and ported software. Yes. Um, my favorite item in that regard is uh, Firefox. Um, you notice I mentioned Firefox a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh, Firefox, is, from a portability perspective, is absolutely horrible software. It's uh, full of if devs it's full of... Um, platform specific choices uh, for no good reason and uh, it's an upstream uh, that doesn't care about anything but free operating systems. Um, I just checked, um, there's a bug report for Dragonfly support in uh, Firefox that was opened in 2004. Uh, it's a birthday uh, celebration is in two weeks. And uh, it, 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 it's been closed uh, at least once uh, due to inactivity. And um, the main problem is um, they want uh, the patch submitter to do their legwork. Like, um, you're not allowed to uh, submit uh, one patch for the whole Firefox distribution. But you have to run after every single maintainer of a subcomponent, uh, get the approval. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, that's not how open source works. So that, that's one part. Um, you mentioned um, the Fortran. Uh, the difference between Fortran and the C C++ compilers is C and C++ compilers actually have agreed upon ABIs. Uh, Fortran yeah. never made it to that point, and uh, that's actually one reason why uh, scientific software has has to have so many if devs. Oh, yeah. uh, it's painful. Well, a lot of those if devs also were uh, sort of optimizing. Like a lot of that is the. Admittedly, you may disagree with the idea of hand optimizing stuff, but you know some of those were 
But my, my point with, for that was just that, you know, at least in, for, in Fortran circles, people use multiple compilers, so you test it. I realize that C, supposedly that should, there are reasons it doesn't do all. In theory, you don't have to, but in practice, you know, you want to get that one percent more uh, performance because yeah. Uh, yeah, your application is going to run a month. Uh, right. One percent makes quite a difference by that. Yeah. Uh, if you go back one slide, I think it was one slide. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. I'd say uh, the first item on that list yeah. actually should be a test for features and uh, don't test for names. I, test that was, test, I, testing yeah. for names is perfectly fine in one situation. If you want to uh, override bug, yes. Um, for example, there are, there are a lot of configure scripts that um, add uh, some fancy G GCC options to work around a uh, bug in GCC uh, two eight four or whatever version, uh, and those bugs have been fixed in the meantime, and they still add all those uh, fancy yeah. crappy, crappy options, and they don't test for the. Uh, well, this is uh, the broken, the infamous broken uh, Red Hat uh, GCC release uh, that resulted in GCC 2.97 uh, getting named and uh, things like that. But uh, writing uh, proper feature tests is actually quite hard. Yes, that's true. It is harder than it's easier to test for names for sure. Yes, and uh, contrary to a popular belief, uh, autoconf actually is on the better side uh, when it comes to this. Many of the autoconf replacement like uh, scones for example, oh, well, scones is absolutely horrible when I it comes to trying to write something that is portable. Yeah, the problem is that there are many of them. If there was one too, yeah. it would be okay. But I mean, Scons was one hard. Guy using one, another guy using another. It, it, we, we had a trouble with Scons in the one project I, that I worked on with that, where we were supporting Three operated, you know. We were supporting three. I think it was like two versions of Linux and Windows, and we had basically one full-time person yeah. working on the build stuff for that. Not even the build stuff, the configure stuff. And it was still, you know, I don't even know. How, I can't even remember how like late that part got done compared to what you know the original things in the contract were. It's crazy. So, yeah. That's not, that's not my favorite computer. <laughs> if, if you want to get rid of autoconf, at least choose CMake for all its faults. Mm -hmm. uh, it's at least written by people that understood the problem. <laughs> yes, yes, it at least is attempting to solve the problem. It's attempting to solve the problem that it was written to solve, rather it's, than, I don't know what the other one is attempting to solve, but not the problem it was written to solve. We've, we've started to see software that relies on certain versions of CMake just recently mm -hmm. and so even going to CMake as a, as a halfway hack yeah. is going to be right with the problems. Yeah. Um, we should talk after the review yeah. Yeah, because I'm, I'm looking at, at a bulk build report from December um, last year on Bitrig namely 64, and there's 10,435 packages built there, so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that's a much larger number than I remember. Yeah, yeah so that's good. Thanks, Nicole. We, we should tell. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I'm not, you know, as I was saying in those other slides, I'm totally not opposed to the sort of shit. I don't even like that term. I feel like there's a better, but I never came up with something, though, shared systems. Right. It, it's just that... We've, we've already encountered a whole lot of problems, like we get the GCC CC. Yes, I know, you guys are. So that, that's abstracted out anyway, yeah. right? So, uh, right, no, if there's any other group that's seen a lot of this mess, it's... We've done a lot of Definitely the you know. for Clank, for example. And actually, I think we are still in a better position when it comes to Clank support than from BSD uh, because they tend to more aggressively mark things as GCC only uh, instead yeah. of just fixing them. So yeah, I hate when that's the solution to be just be like use GCC. Great because that yeah we're, we're trying you're trying to use Clang for a reason because it's good at some things. There shouldn't be that many programs that are deep down GCC only. Also, we're using uh, the package system 
from the system itself. Yeah, we have the problem that we have a handful of packages. So we, we uh, moved. Obviously, so the open BSD. Yeah, well, we're, no. Yeah. Well, sort of. Well, it's, it's part of some of the base tools. So since we use Git for um, version control, some. we didn't put, we didn't want Git, we don't want Git in base. But we, you don't even have the, you know, quote unquote useful system, despite what I was saying for the first like half of my talk, without having the version control. So if it's not going to be in base, it's got to be in our cores. So we need to build a bunch of cores to have. So yeah, we've got that. That's not that different from uh, what, for example, Jonathan Hacking is doing on smart OS. Uh, so. Yeah. Is yeah. it solvable with package shorts to do like because of the bootstrap? We can't just start from nothing, we have to put that in the base. Uh, you can almost start from nothing yeah. as long as you have a compiler and yes. yes. Yeah. So um, what they are doing in SmartOS is basically they uh, have a blessed compiler in a secondary prefix and uh, use that to build uh, the normal system, including uh, the normal compiler, so... Okay, that's interesting. I guess I need to look at, I'm curious to look at what their process sound. Yep. Interesting. interesting. Yeah, we, we have to look at what those are going to Yeah. And I can see your, your point about um, wanting to have bring people on board by using the, the packaging system to do that. Yes, that but not doing it the other way, the converse is that a lot of these problems have already been attacked and uh, yeah. potentially solved. Right. Like that. So, so, so to, for some definition of solved. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I guess we need to have a longer discussion. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, that's the... That's the bucket today. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, well, are there any more questions? Because I see people coming in for the next bucket. <laughs> okay. yeah. 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 Well, thank you.